August of 2013. Michael Brown died August of 2014. In August of 2013, a 21-year-old woman by the name of Bonita was killed in a drive-by. She was holding her nine-month-old baby. And she was in the, in the car with her fiancé, and they believed the bullet was meant for him, uh, that they didn't have a pastor. Actually, that's so I became the pastor, and I did that funeral, um, and the church was packed. It was standing room only. I never knew she had my car until August 9, 2014. Sierra lived and started going out into the street and feeling the pain. Um, and knowing that I was called to respond to that pain in any kind of way that I could. One of them. Um, one, of, one thing I worked hard on as a member of that committee was to make sure that Texas was a second chance state. That was something that was really important to me. The making sure that I'm the only black female sometimes in the room and on the dais. And if I don't say them and I don't speak up for our children, we certainly will continue to lose. I want you to know that you have African American men and women in the Texas House and men in the Senate that are working for you. Um, I Hello, hello everybody. So glad that you're here. Come on and let us know. Let us know where you're from, who you are. We want to say hello to you. Look, hello there, Renee Jones. How you doing? Hello there, Doris Thorne. Hello there, Yomi. Hello there, Cherry. It is good to see you. Let us know you're here. Where are you from? Orlando, Temple Hills, Maryland, Dallas, Fort Worth. We're glad that you're here. Hey, Sharon from Michigan. Michigan. Yes, that's Come on, Detroit. You close to Detroit? Yeah. Okay. Detroit. <laughs> Hello there, Sawana. Sayana, you are from San Antonio. Good to see you. Hello there, mm -hmm. Betty from Dallas. Hello there, Andrea Shellman from Boston. It's wonderful to see you. I'm glad that you're here. We, well, I'll tell you what. Dr. Wright, how are you doing in these streets? I am doing absolutely fabulous. Looking forward to anticipating I have, uh, as you know, I'm the grandmother of 24, and 20 of those 24 are girls. Yo, and wait, wait, wait. You, you know, she's just going to slide by that. I, Come I, on. I, I, Did y'all hear what she said? She said, 24. 24. 24 grandchildren. Grandchildren. Let that, let that and how many in. children, okay. though, first? I have four how many children. And I have. I have four natural, and then yeah, I have sure. two I took off the street, so I have six. Mm. Okay. So, but my, okay. my grandchildren are absolutely amazing. My oldest granddaughter is 24. She is actually graduating uh, next week, next Sunday, for, uh, with her master's. And when you talk about a dynamic young woman, this young lady started out in secondary or in primary education, taught second grade for two years, and a position came open in one of the high schools to teach at-risk children, as they say. These are seniors that they said were not going to graduate. Yeah. And for the first time in a long, many years, they had a senior night. They had, they're having their graduation. She's got 25 graduating. And not only does she have 25 of those kids that are graduating this amidst the gang uh, uh, in the middle of the gang fights, the 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 baby mama drama, all of this stuff. And God has given her such favor and respect with these children. And so now, while she was doing all of that, she was going to school to get her master's and she will be graduating on uh, she'll be graduating Sunday. 
in Columbia, Missouri from the University of Missouri. So I'm really excited about that and excited wow. for her. She's a very unique young woman, young girl, young girl, already working on the process of her superintendent certificate, even though she doesn't have the te the years behind of the teaching. So all she's got to do is do the teaching and then she can go on and become the superintendent. I'm yes. telling you. Yes, that's, that's how we do it. That's it. And the Bible says without a provision. Well, she does that, yeah, send her to Georgia because they, they like to uh, hire folk, fire and pay their contract out. Oh, so well, let me tell you. <laughs> that AKA ain't going to have it. <laughs> I know that's right. Oh, wow, it's good to see you, Sherry. Yep, I was not far from there at all. Um, hello there, Dr. Um, Bailey Robinson from Indiana. Good to see you. Hello there. It's good. Hey, from the Bronx, I see you, Dr. Farrell. Okay. Hey, Sherry, how you doing from Frisco? Dr. Um, Marjorie Hamilton Scott from McKinney's. Good to have you. Dr. Wallace, how you doing? I am super fantastic, wonderful, enjoying a little bit of the ACPE National um, Conference with uh, the Association for Professional Chaplains. They have a joint um, conference this week, so I've been enjoying some of that. And and they are the I'm I'm loving their. Um, theme around uh, anti-bias. They had a sister uh, from uh, from Ohio yesterday that talked to them about African uh, spirituality and the wisdom uh, tradition as, as well. And <laughs> she helped them, uh, all religions come from, all of us come out of Africa. Some folk just went north. Um, uh, so, it oh, was, so she was getting them all together strong. right. She was yeah. getting together right, right? Yeah, <laughs> that is wonderful. Yeah, yeah. it's it. been it's been a great, great um, conference so far. So uh, I've wow. been in and out of that uh, today. We're so proud of you, Dr. Just, Wallace. We are so very proud of you for doing I that. When I grow up, yes. Oh. We have a couple of things we want to talk about prior to uh, bringing our guest on. Um, First, um, last week we talked about um, Dr. Burns being, she offering herself to the Episcopal office of the CME Church. And we want to make sure that we support her with our love, our prayers, and yes. our money. Yes. So what, I want you to make sure that we're supporting. So um, Dr. Shazetta Hill was going, there you go. These are the ways to give. Um, you can go to her website, www.drbjb.org, cash app, dollar sign, We the People 2022, PayPal, doc, Dr. VJB Ministries at gmail.com. And of course, you can send it in mail. Um, and we call it snail mail, right? But it still, gets to it, it, it still gets to its final destination. So you can send it that way as well. We the People 1405 Foxtail Court. Lake Mary, Florida, three two seven four four six, and I want I want this to stay here because I want you to see what she stands for. A leader that believes in you, and her slogan is "We the People." Burns for Bishop. So please support her with your prayers, with your donations, and if you are a delegate, with your votes. We love you, Doctor Doctor Burns, and we look forward to having you back next week. Amen. We also want to talk about Sailor Reads. Sailor Reads is an in initiative that Bishop McKenzie started. And this week, this Thursday, she is talking to Minda Hartz. She's the author of the memo. Her new, her latest book is Right Within, How to Heal from Racial Trauma in the Workplace. It's mm. May 12th at 7 p.m. Central. Register, registration is free. You can go on e Eventbrite slash Sailor Reads and register. I promise you, you will not be disappointed. So go on in and register. Thank you, Bishop McKenzie, for sending that to us. Well, we want to talk just a tad about what's going on in Georgia or what went on in Georgia. I'm not sure if I can share, but I'm going to try. Let's see here. Let's see. We can do it. 
All right. Let's see if we can do it. If we can do it, then we're 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 ready. If All not, right. we'll just talk about it because many we're folks are going to talk about it. All mm -hmm. right. So let's go. Well, we had some Georgia police to pull over Delaware State lacrosse team, predominantly black girls, moving, ready to go back home to Delaware. And they got stopped by the police. It was, what did you call it? Um, the dogs sniffing. Profiling, profiling. They brought, they brought in the drug dogs and they told the girls, if you tell us where the stuff is, it'll be easier than if we have to go look for it. How the hot ham and cheese do you fix yourself to just make an assumption like that just because you saw some black girls on a bus in Georgia, Dr. Mm -hmm. Wallace? Dr. Wallace. And they did, and they did not. I I wrote on on uh, Burns' uh, web page. I I just started asking questions. When is it going to stop? It's de it's it's uh, de despicable. I am so sick and tired of black folk being profiled, black folk getting killed in the streets by police, and there are no seemingly no consequences because there was nothing in the article that talked about what the consequences were for these policemen who stopped them and had nothing, 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 nothing. They found nothing. So it, at least there ought to be a written um, apology to the uh, Delaware State lacrosse team in my mind. You know what I kept hearing though? Um, when I read the article, it said, breathe, but not too heavy. Look, but not, but don't appear guilty. Speak, That's it. but Speak. never answer back. These are the constant reminders of being black in America. When is it gonna stop? Don't you just get tired of, mm -hmm. yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, yes, sir, no, sir. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. Wait a minute. We should. It's 2022 That's and we're still having to say the same things as our great grandparents, grandparents and parents had to say. Yes, the um um sister Casey, Reverend Casey, yes, um Brittany yes. Griner. She is still locked up for some some stuff they thought they they saw. And it's foolishness. My grandbabies, my uh my uh, god baby's dad was born and raised in Birmingham, Alabama phenomenal, phenomenal young man. But as my God babies were born and they started to come forth, you know, and I'm teaching them that proper, that proper language and yes, ma'am and no, ma'am. And he finally told me one day, he said, I would prefer that they just say yes and no. Mm -hmm. He said, because when I was growing up, he said, that was very berating. Yeah, he said that was what was used to hold mm. us in and keep us in our place. He said, right. I don't want my children saying, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, yes, sir, no, sir. He said, I just want them to say yes and no. And it and and, and Dr. Bradford, you're you're absolutely right because it's coming to a point. My fear is that the children are starting to rise up. They're coming into the knowledge of who they really are with not just African-American history, but with black history. They know that they are somebody. They know that they didn't come from junk. They know that they're not a mess. I I, I met, a, uh, I was with an older lady on a Sunday who was born and raised in uh, uh, Muskogee, Oklahoma. And she said her history book, they had black people in their history books, but none of them ever did anything good. Oh mm -hmm. yeah. Well you, well, you know that's that's, you that's, know, that's why we need that's why we need crit critical race theory in schools so that <laughs> oh, the oh, whole we story. Well, we don't want to hurt story. anybody's feelings, right? We don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. So I, I digress. Well, it's okay that you hurt my book. feelings by getting on a bus, <laughs> and I, I don't have any drugs. It's okay that you hurt sure. my feelings, and and. and but it's not okay that other folk feelings are hurt. And Girl, the main thing is you can't hurt nobody's feelings unless they decide that their feelings are hurt. We, can, listen, we don't hurt somebody's feelings. They were throwing underwear. Yes. 
pulling all their stuff out of their bags, looking for something and asking them, if you tell me now, there won't be any consequences. What we, We're going to take you to jail. What you taking me to jail for? What? What? Come on here. It's Let ridiculous. me introduce this guest because, you know, we could talk on and on about that. Ooh, yes. Lord. I'm, I'm hoping that in Selah Reads, we might, in this racial trauma, we might be able to get to some answers. Yeah, the book is amazing. It really is. Um, well, the Reverend Dr. Dominique A. Robinson, a New Jersey native, is a millennial womanist homiletician and justice advocate. Reared in the Pentecostal tradition, she answered her call to ministry at the age of 13, and it definitely shows. Dominique earned her Bachelor of Arts in Government from Georgetown University, Master of Divinity concentrating in Biblical inter Interpretation, and Master of the Theology concentrating in Homiletics, both from Candler School of Theology. She earned a Doctor of Ministry degree from Columbia Theological Seminary in Gospel and Culture. Her dissertation, I Homiletics, huh, trademarked by her, Preaching That Clicks, is a groundbreaking research and co consulting service to assist faith leaders with developing impactful ministry that employs technology and social media linguistics. She currently is a PhD student woo, at Christian Theological Seminary in the world's first African-American preaching and sacred rhetoric PhD program. Dr. Robinson is the new John Hines assistant professor of, Richard, of preaching at the Seminary of Southwest in Austin, Texas. She takes pride, great pride, in being the former inaugural dean of chapel and assistant professor of religion at Wiley College in Marshall, Texas. Dr. Robinson is an ordained itinerant elder in the AME Zion Church and a member of the illustrious -wee, Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. She is, she is continuously humbled by our opportunities to share God's word and desires to march to the drumbeat of God's heart. I introduce to you and present to others, Dr. Dominique Robinson. Woo -woo! Look, There's one all against her. There's one all. Welcome, welcome her in is to say, welcome, welcome, Dr. Robinson. Greetings, greetings. Look at look at um Dr. Dr. Kokisha Bailey Robinson saying blessings to you, Dr. Robinson. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes, that's that Robinson Soror cousin. You, you already know, you know. This has I love when you come on the show because you light us up, period. <laughs> I wanna before I ask about how you're doing these COVID streets with all your new stuff that you got got going on, do you have any comments about this Delaware madness? Uh, without profanity being employed. Um, Go ahead. I, well, it, you know, this really is some shit. Like, I, like there really is nothing better to describe uh, what's happening, how it's happening, where it's happening. And I don't know if we ever will find answers because quite honestly, there's no rationale for the way we, people of color, are being treated in these supposed United States of America. I don't think it will matter what we teach in any classrooms. These are biases that we have to, you, you, you got to start at the seed, the womb. You, you got to grab racist children. I see you, Ro Harrison, clutching your pearls. I, you know, but it, it listen, it's, it's language you probably use at home. It's all right. I'm just saying, but it is what it is. It's, it's a matter of like, I pray. It's one of those things you say, isn't that what Jesus died on the cross for? I pray. But the truth of the matter is, you know, this is where I might be challenging some of our theology early already. I don't know if there is resolve for racism because it existed biblically. Jesus came and died and it still uh, it still was not eradicated. Right. Like, I mean, when we look at the Old Testament, it, it's while many people or Hebrew scriptures, I should say, my many people argue there are no uh, there are no current racial paradigms we're projecting that on the hebrew scriptures there certainly are some ethnicities known and there's Whoa. certainly something about there's certainly something about a chosen people of an ethnic group um 
who somehow who, were in who suppressed the other folk in the same region. So exactly. there had to be some racism going on in order for them. It, th their consciousness had to be uh, distorted in order to just think they were privileged Superior. to Superior. take somebody else's land. Absolutely. And, right. So the entire Old Testament or Hebrew scriptures is around land and conquest and patriarchy and misogyny. But there's something about Egyptians holding, uh, you know, Israelites in captivity um, and that being an ongoing uh, narrative uh, to, to, you know, there, there's, there's something about that. And then then for those the New Testament, the Second Testament scholars who will turn around and say, well, Jesus was sent. there's something that Jesus said to that woman at the table. When he said he was sent for a particular people, I, all I'm saying is, come on, say, uh, oh, God, no, say, when he called her a dog. Now I said shit already. I'm not gonna push the line no further. I want your, I want your, I want your broadcast to remain on, um, you know, prime time television and not cut off. Yes, uh, yes, we understand. That, yeah, that's, that's what he just said, dog. That's what Jesus called her. He surely did. And so I'm saying that there, there clearly was still even in New Testament or or, or he, like, like the Greek Testament around a, a matter of ethnic diversity and challenges within. So I don't know if we'll ever resolve it. I think we are called to love in the midst of it. I don't know if we will ever resolve it because, well, now I'm going down a whole nother rabbit hole. I don't no, want to no, go for it. Before we even deal with racism, I mean, black people, y'all going to deal with colorism and classism mm. and elitism? Because I think that when we start dealing with Ooh. internal now, issues. Now, ooh, think, now you're I, talking about uh, Abraham Kendi and his yeah. de definition of racism. And I, you know, I, I had some problems with that. You know, even I, I do think that there are some prejudices yes. against colorism because you know and their privileges that people get but i'm not sure african americans and people of color have enough power yet mm. to be racist so, uh -oh. so let me ask you a question I, I i want you to know that this is a complex matter so i do agree here's where my question comes in Yes, we have a lot of internal isms we need to deal with. Patriarchy, sexism, ageism, ableism, all of that stuff that we need to deal with. Discrimination. What do mm -hmm. we call when we are racist towards other ethnic groups? Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. I, I mean, talk, talk to me about how that happens. Are, are you saying because they have power in the workplace that they work, somebody works for them? Or is it the person who owns the corp the the corporation? That's where I get okay. kind of fuzzy. And I, and I want to be really upfront in saying I agree with you, Dr. Wallace. Mm -hmm. I, I'm still reconciling on, or still working through what to call it when mm -hmm. black folk don't like Korean people or yeah. Mexican people, mm -hmm. um, or we mistreat them or put them in stereotypes because of their ethnicity. Mm -hmm. I'm sure it's, I'm, it's short. I'm sure it's still a discrimination. I'm mm -hmm. wondering, though, like you said, around power in comparison to some of those other ethnic groups, refugees, uh, yeah. immigrants, mm -hmm. because of the sense of power we might have, are we being racist towards them? Now, I don't know. I don't have an answer, y'all, on timely wisdom. I'm not. We don't have no answers. We are here to provoke your thoughts. For you, Reverend, 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 Reverend Casey. Thank you so much, Dr. Robbins. Reverend Casey is putting here prejudice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we're limit, limiting it to one word, but it's, man, it can be a conglomerate, right? Mm -hmm. But I mean, yeah. start, some people have to die out and I'm not sure enough of them have died yeah. like they were going to the um, promised land. You know, there, there are certain people in the Senate right now that will need to die before some changes can be uh, implemented. And that's right. And that's with the local church, too. Some of you people in them churches causing them problems. Some of y'all going to have to go on. To oh! Go ahead, Dr. Robinson. Go ahead. Go ahead, Dr. Robinson. I love it. <laughs> Wait. But, but, we okay, live. What, yo, we live. Dr. Burns ain't going to be able to edit this. We what live. do they do before, <laughs> before they die, though? They teach others to, to behave like they did. Huh? Exactly. Yeah. On, you want to control me. somebody's body. You don't care about uh, children 
all you care about is birthing. You know that some you you want you want to control who can be born rather than um, helping all of the children that need help on this planet. Not right now, but right now. Okay, all right. I got something for you then. What 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 do y'all think about this? Uh, my daughter said, "Mommy, if <laughs> if you are going to get an abortion." If you need to have an abortion, it it that cost is expensive. Yeah. But if you're going to get a vasectomy, it's a hundred dollars. And you know what? And I can do it for free if they let me kick them. So I don't even understand. <laughs> you know, you know I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But but, I mean, but, that, but, but, but they're not you know, doing anything with penises since that's where it starts. <laughs> but you that's, look, that's, you that's where it starts. At, if you look at, I mean, my daughter said, if what if men start to have babies? Would they still have the same control? Would they still want? They wouldn't survive. Well, we would be back to ashes to ashes, and so yeah, because they wouldn't survive. See, I did. I had them real babies. My first one was ten three. My second one was ten. So let's start there. Yo, they wouldn't survive. They couldn't have them. Yo. I'm with you, Doc. My, my there is wouldn't. a doctor, an MD on the line that says you don't even need a scalpel to perform a vasectomy. Uh-oh. Okay. Help us, Lord. Help us. Mm -hmm. Where the doctor? Where the doctor? I so said. He can open up a practice because I, you know. You know, student, student. I'm always about it. establishing an additional the, means. The people that they are trying to keep from having <laughs> abortions have resources for which to go to other states. The only pe the people that are being um, hurt by this are people who have suffered incest, who are poor, mm. Mm. who cannot afford to cross state lines to um, <laughs> people that have been raped. It, it's just, it's, it's just- are you this, again, my word, despicable. All of it is you despicable. You as a white male can tell every woman or women how they can, what they can do with their own body. Betty Brown said, if the men were having abortions, there would be an abortion clinic on every corner. My God. That's usually mm -hmm. the way it is. What's that you, Dr. Robinson? I'm looking for the verse in Exodus that somewhat explains slavery and it was based off of the fact of the children of Israel multiplying too quickly. Yes. 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 Mm -hmm. You know, because yes. folks don't want to be the man, no is it Genesis 20. Look at Wait. look at tw Genesis 20. So I am I'm I'm I'm, I'm the I'm, midwives I'm, decided that we we they coming too fast so we can't really um we can't we can't can't stop them. Yeah. Correct. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm in is I'm in Israel. I'm in Exodus chapter one verse 8 where it says and a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph he said to his people look the Israelite people are more numerous and more powerful than we come let us deal shrewdly with them or they may increase in an event of war join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land all I'm saying is it sounds like uh the the the, the practice of what people are using I'm just all I'm saying is somewhere I read something that sounds like what we're talking about, that somehow people are trying to control who's being multiplied and becoming too numerous because God forbid they become partners with our enemies, then they will overtake us. Oh, oh, hey, wait, wait. That, that that that'll preach right there. That will oh, that will that's, preach that's preaching already. What you mean? The of, <laughs> all the people of color band together today. We don't need to wait for a little while longer. If they oh. band together today, we can wipe them out right now. If oh. we want to fight, if you want what, to fight, what's the year that they'll walk in? Then they'll um they'll be the minority. What is it? Twenty uh, thirty 20 years from now? Is it twenty or forty years from now? Twenty two. They'll be the minority. That's why they're trying to control. Mm -hmm. What I understand. Exactly. I don't know oh, what the numbers exactly. are. But I already walk around like we in the majority. Everything, yeah. everything they say as if it's normal. I'd be like, who's we? Says who? Mm. What standard? Mm -hmm. Since you bought me here to teach it, I'm gonna keep asking. So you say what now? You okay. say you want you want to define beloved community? Let me help you with your definition. Mm. <laughs> Absolutely. 
I need to talk to you because I got two Oral Roberts University students right now who are driving me slap out of my mind. And I have to often, they, they had no idea what womanist theology or liberation theology was. <laughs> so, you know, I'm, I'm having, I'm having to start from scratch. You know, they, it's, 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 it's horrible. Dr. Roberts, I was teaching in, in the in the Bible college and, and got two Baptist preachers and started out the semester having to have conversations with them to the point to where I finally told the dean, you need to do something because this isn't what the class is about. And I'm not going to come in every night and argue with them as to whether or not God called the woman to preach. Mm. It um, makes absolutely no sense. That's not what we're here for. And the fact that they feel it's okay to continue to disrupt everybody else's space with ignorance. Dr. Wright, I, I, I want to hear what Dr. Robinson has to say about that. Because I've heard this conversation before. Please and thank you. I almost just again. Hold on. Wait a minute. Now, see, first of all, I already got a problem with the fact that you're the student trying to earn one of my degrees thinking you're going to come in here asking questions. Uh-huh. What a part of the syllabus. So I don't care your color or your creed. You better learn the elit elitism of the academy. You trying to earn one of the degrees hanging on my wall, you better come in here and sit down. And yeah. you better make sure you had read this stuff before I get up here and lecture. And since I'm a black you better not fix your mouth to come up here trying to challenge my existence when that is not a part of the lecture layout for this week. So I, you know, Dr. Wright, I, you know, I'm just beginning my journey. So I have to stay sanctified to make sure my check keeps clearing. But I have been really clear around the fact that, because you know, in my space, they somehow call their professors by their first name. And I'd be like, tut -tut. Oh. <laughs> tut -tut. The, the least you're going to do is put professor in front of my name. But I tell you what, when I finish this PhD, you will say Dr. Dr. Robinson for at least three months before I, I'm not even going to respond. I'm like, did you, did you say one doctor? You must be talking to one of my colleagues. But, but uh, so, uh, uh, I, you know, I think it is, it is, I think it is important for us as, uh, well, one, I'm going to say this. I'm grateful for the women who've done this work well before I was ever born mm -hmm. um, because they have already paved the way. Those of you who are continuously doing the work paved the way both in the academy and in the church and all spaces of employment uh, for somebody like me with such a brash mouth to come into the space, uh, mm -hmm. to, <laughs> you know, um, to be able to even, to even exist. So I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that work has already been done. Is this not beginning with me or anybody who comes after me? And I think one, if my generation first recognizes that, realizes that and continues to work on the work that has already been there and act like it didn't start with you and your arrival, I think that's the first thing. Secondly, um, I think it's a shame that when we as women and compound the fact that we are also black, decide to speak up for ourselves, put boundaries in place or articulate things that somehow we are not passionate, but we are aggressive. Um, yes. wow. I, think, I think I think that's the fine dance that we all have to work through, right? Like we already have strong voices. So when you talk about I'm loud, for me, when I, the same way you say Anglican, I hear white. When you say loud, I hear thug, the same way you're using the N-word. So I have to now let you know about your coded language that you're using and how I'm interpreting it since you are the minority. Like, you know, like at the end, like I gotta, I gotta change my mindset and help them. Black men are controlling too. Well, you know. Yes. Mr. Casey, yes. uh, we oh. we are assertive. We are we're we're not no, we're they, not they, aggressive. I mean, if you want to be real, they they're saying the B word, or you are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, really, I'm passionate, but you're calling me that that B mm -hmm. word. Mm -hmm. Dr. Robertson, you are starting this. You are finishing up your first year as a full time. Oh well, let me um, forgive me. First full-time African American theology faculty at Seminary of the Southwest. Ooh. And you're developing young minds, preparing young preachers for the next level of preaching. I just want you to share with us what, what is that like and how are they receiving your, your passion? <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. Um. Uh, I will say on the large scheme of things, things have been absolutely amazing. I think that um, the things I've prayed for, I'm living into them. I've mm -hmm. always dreamt of teaching, preaching. Um, mm -hmm. 
I have always imagined being able to be in a space where what I study as a pupil is matching up with what I'm doing as a professor and preacher. And I'm in that season. Uh, literally everything I'm reading for a paper can also be applied to the classroom. And I am extremely grateful for that because I was not always in that season where I was being pulled in different directions. And people assume that preparing for preaching is an easy craft or science. And it is not. It is not. And the work that it takes to be creative for preaching, particularly in our wonderful black traditions, is a different working of creativity that uh, that is different from preparing for lectures or presentations right. or academic work and writing. And so I'm grateful that I can now have the space to try and kind of maneuver between those things in those places. Um, so I have had great joy and I've been thoroughly entertained by people getting accustomed to me changing my hair every month. Me always looking like I'm overdressed when these are just my good work clothes. Um, <laughs> them not knowing what my facial expressions means because I'm still wearing a mask. Itabashando. I don't care what the rest of the people of God do. Hallelujah. Uh, so you, they need to learn my eyebrows, what they mean, need to either be quiet mm -hmm. or keep talking. There's so many things um, that uh, they have had to kind of learn and engage. Thankfully, I was hired along with a Korean American woman, a New Testament scholar, and a new Latinx program director who was a Latin A woman. And so we call ourselves the Trinity. Uh, we tell them that we really are the true embodiment of what it means to be the Holy Parent, the Son mm -hmm. and the Holy Ghost. Uh, I told them that the, 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 you know, God being a black woman in the kitchen cooking was well before the shack for me. It was my grandmother. So, I, you know, I'm just living, <laughs> I'm just living <laughs> what we got to do and be, you know, we, we'll give some white author credit for putting it in a book and making a movie, but we've been living that for a long time. God has been a creator of making leftovers into meals for a long time for us. And so we already know the shack ain't shiznick on us. We got it. And so um, it's been interesting living that out. I will tell you, I've learned a lot. I've learned um, how much we as black scholars and practitioners have to be really clear with articulating that I don't have to do the research of knowing your stuff to start with the authority of my stuff. So when I teach, wait, 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 uh, uh, wait, wait. I need to write that down. I don't yeah. have to take a slow and read. Read it back. Read it back. I, I don't have to read your stuff to begin with the authority of my stuff. So I, I don't have to go back and read Karl Barth. I can start with Henry Mitchell if I want to. Because that that because that is because of our theologies being birthed out of liberation and experience and existence, then I'm starting the authority of the scholarship that I'm teaching in from from my my experience and my people. Uh, so so <laughs> so no, I'm not going to mention Breckis. I'm going to start with Lisa Thompson. And, and and say it again. So so <laughs> it's been it's been interesting to help individuals recognize that who they thought were the authoritative beginnings of a field have nothing because we've been doing this well before you published it. So I've had joy of seeing light bulbs go off and seeing people's discomfort. The truth is my students are a lot more open and receptive of the information than my colleagues. Now, I love my colleagues. We work through a lot of very difficult things together around differences. But what I'm finding is that most of the issues are not with our students being open and receptive to various ways of living, studying and engaging. I'm going to have to I'm going to have to start. Listen, Dr. Farrow, I'm stuck. I'm fat. Listen, while I'm here, because I have a good Good time doing this. If I'm going to talk about black woman is preaching, I'm going to go right to Katie Cannon, Donna, no. Teresa Fry Brown. I'm I'm starting there. Don't ask me nothing. And, and quite frankly, I'm gonna start with Henry Mitchell if you want me to for black preaching. But if I'm gonna start with my black preaching, I'm starting with the women. But I'm, I'm I might go off. I might let me stay. Well, calm. you can start with Ella. You can you can start with Ella. That's Come right. On. Right. That's right. You know. And so let me calm down before I get caught up. You know what I'm saying? And hallelujah. And I, you know, and, and quite honestly, even the book that we give to, I can't remember his name right now. Uh, Isaac Rufus, Isaac, Isaac Clark, Isaac Rufus Clark. We, we might, we give that, we need to get that credit to Katie Cannon. She, she was a scribe, but I, you know, we leave it alone. We'll start eat. I don't want nobody to get their feelings hurt, but I'm just saying, I'm, I'm, I'm just saying, I'm just, I mean, if we're going to talk about the history of the black church, we might we gotta start with the women. Yeah, we glad that you um yeah yeah you, know, you were 
you in the preaching in the public face of it, but we put your clothes on, you got you together. Uh, and as I've been watching the First Lady docu-series, I've been watching how Eleanor Roosevelt got President Roosevelt's speeches together. That's the for a long time. The women, so, the women. That, there's just, a documentary that uh, Katie Cannon is on, um, Womanist Theology on YouTube. And they start <laughs> with showing I, you know what? I love the a guy from Texas, uh, Freddie Haynes. Mm -hmm. He says that if the women decide the they're not going to come to church anymore, I'm going to take a text that says, finally, my brother. <laughs> <laughs> he said, because I'm going to go with the women. Yeah, Y'all can stay here. But it, I'm going to go with the women. And so, I, yeah. I believe wholeheartedly he is my classmate in our doctoral program. Oh. And so it's been, it's been, man, it's been rich to, to, to dialogue with what people would consider to be giants in our church mm -hmm. who are willing to reevaluate how they enter a text and dialogue about a text and set a new standard and example so that these new waves of preachers coming up could see that if a brother who is in his 60s or 70s is willing to reevaluate it, you better too. If you are willing to design a flyer for Good Friday or for church anniversary and every picture is a male, it's problematic if you don't even know a decent female preacher because the truth is, now I might hurt somebody. There's feelings. a lot of us. There's we a there's a new of us. There's a no, slew of us. Anyway, but Hold on, back that up, back that up, and run that again. Can you run that back? We out preach them anyway. But since you want to go ahead and uh, uh, design your flyers and your services uh, for a particular way, and while I'm here, beloved, can we also consider the fact? of the diversity in preaching voices and styles, and stop acting like we need a preacher to hoop to close out the sermon? We don't. <laughs> Now, I'll, hear me. I'll, I'll, go, I'll go to the cross. Now, now don't even get me started with that because some of these texts don't even get to the cross. I don't even know how you right. got here. But that's what they, that's how they end. That's how they end. And the truth is, I heard you end, but I have no idea how you began and how you got here. And, and now that I am a preacher professor, I do lean back and say, now, what sermon form was that? Because I don't know how we got to the cross. But, here's oh. the thing, you know, I am also a church baby. Oh, I love some good carrying on. I love black church aesthetic. Get me a good organ, a washboard, a tambourine with the skin on. I am the person who will throw a shoe at the preacher. I will say, Negro, I'm the person I'm carrying on. You start and I'm like, yeah, I'm the person carrying on. But brother and sister and non-binary sibling, you better have something to say before you get to hooping and hollering. And That's we better right. be, we have to teach our people to have a broader palette to hear and receive various styles of preaching so they can hear good content and not just Absolutely. good sound. But Tatiana, I'm just saying, Burton, I'm just saying, all mm -hmm. I'm saying is there are some people who have a good sound and you think that sounds like good preaching because you think it'll help you raise your offering. But when you ask about the content of what they've said, they've said absolutely nothing. So mm -hmm. all I am saying is that we have to broaden our palate to understand that good preaching comes in a variety of ways and that it happens from all genders, sexualities, gender expressions, ages, and we have and, and abilities. Because how many preachers? Now I'm pushing into my research. How many preachers who show up differently abled or disabled do we see in our pulpits on a regular basis? Oh, come on, dissertation! Come on here! Come, come on, come on, dissertation! So I, I'm currently, <laughs> I'm currently because when they get to disabled, they retire. Oh, somebody say, ouch. If if they get there, and, and if I'm going to be honest and we say they, we're talking about men. Now, I'm going to just be straight up and say this. I got to my place of research interest because I was at a Proctor conference, Sammy DeWitt Proctor conference, a couple years ago, maybe 2018 or 17, where uh, Dr. Jeremiah Wright was the preacher. Yeah. After yeah. his stroke. Mm. And I sat in it, and the church we were in was uh, Dr. Gina Stewart, another woman of God who's in my that was in my uh, program. She's in the first cohort. Sure. Yeah, she's and, the first cohort. Mm -hmm. yes. And I'm sitting there. I'm, on, I'm in the balcony. And I literally am watching gentlemen pick up Dr. Wright, put him in the pulpit. Beloved, if you're hearing this, you might hear this in my dissertation opening. They put him in the pulpit. They bring a <laughs> music stand to the side. His sermon is in a notebook. And someone, I believe it was his wife and or his daughter, uh, is holding a microphone and flipping the pages for him. And we are listening to his slowed speech 
yes. in preaching. And I can't tell if the room is full of empathy or reception. And it and that's what started my interest in my doctoral work because I started to wonder, one, how often are our churches even shaped for those who are disabled or differently able, uh, let alone just be in a congregation or be in the pulpit. If we say we are made in the image of God, then being clear about the fact that God shows up in various ways and the fact that like, I got to push us beyond, you know, are we allowing women in the pulpit? Are we even allowing disabled bodies in the pulpit to preach or someone with a stutter, a, you know, a speech mm. impediment? We're hearing impediment. And while I'm here, because I'm going to tell you where I'm ultimately, the truth is we're not even okay with uh, obvious oh. disabilities. We we dare to talk about the disabilities we can't see, like depression or mental anguish or emotional issues. So let me tell you, my research is looking on whether or not depression impacts African-American biblical interpretation rooted in millennial womanist discourse. Please like, call me, girl. Call me, call me, call me, call me, call me, call me, call me. So that, well, that, that's that's what, Woo! Cause our <laughs> mental health, I believe, almost. Mm. So that's where I'm going. Ninety-five percent of them yeah. are are mentally disabled, have some mental disability. That's it. So that's where I'm going. That's where I'm going. Based off the question, my initial answer is yes. Obviously, I need to do the research to prove my answer, right? And I and, and I already feel like I have it. I'm I'm asking particular persons who are willing to disclose, which is already a risky business, to yeah. help me. Uh, doing interviews and uh, do some case studies with them because I want to evaluate what your sermon preparation was like before your official diagnoses. Because some of us can self diagnose We know, we know where we are. But then beyond that, did it change the way you looked at scripture? And because we are black preachers and one of our tenets of black preaching is to offer hope, which sometimes, oftentimes shows up in celebration of the preaching moment. How do we get from a depressed hermeneutical lens to a celebratory homiletical expression. That's all I'm asking. I'm trying to figure out how we move between those. Um, so I'm right now. I'm 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 knee deep, probably elbow deep. Listen, if you want to line, pray for me. If you love me this summer, send me a cash out for a meal because I'm going into deep reading to prepare for my comps. I'm doing work with uh, Dr. Christina Davis. We're doing an independent study. I am in essence. This is where Black women lineage. I'm picking up where Dr. Monica Coleman left off with bipolar thing. Okay. Yeah. Talk about depression and theology, and I'm moving it to proclamation. Right. So I'm doing some interview work with her. Dr. Tamer Bryant has agreed to do some interview with me so I can so I can have some basic foundational data of where I am. Again, rooted in womanist discourse is where Dr. Uh, Coleman is. I'm moving into millennial womanist discourse. Persons like Melanie Jones and I, Nichelle Gidry and I are working on what that definition is and looks like. Right. Um, and then I'm, I'm rooted. I'm moving through this disability theology, then looking at how depression impacts African-American populations. And, and what that looks like in the past year, we've we've witnessed the suicides of so many persons that we know were connected to some mental illnesses that we were unwilling to talk about, to address, yes. that we wanted to super spiritualize and not even learn the word grammar on how we discuss choice by suicide and rather than taking their own life. Right. And so I know I'm challenging it, but I'm also being vulnerable and saying I experienced it. I mm -hmm. knew what it was like to look at a scripture. And decide Jacob is wrestling with an angel. But I also know what it was like after losing people I loved dearly to say, maybe Jacob is wrestling with himself. Maybe this is anxiety. Maybe this is fear and encountering his brother. Maybe this wasn't an angel. Maybe this was a moment of wrestling. With himself. All I'm saying is, from my experience, it's I her the text then, girl. <laughs> you can yeah, go, girl. <laughs> I, that's right. Listen. So all I'm saying is from my experience, I know that my own mental anguish and emotional distress made me into the text differently. Although it might sound the same in celebration, there's a different way now that I articulate this text. And if it happened for me, I just want to find the research and the work, to, the theory to support the practice, because I do think that because of the pandemic, we now have gained a different reception and perception of discussing mental illnesses. Now, here's the challenge, right? Because we live in a patriarchal society, women who preach and practice already as senior pastors already enter a space where people believe we are disabled. Mm. So I have very few, women, very few mm. women who will be willing to to share with me uh, in my research, I have been depressed or I, you know, I've gone oh, through this. Call me. I was, I, my first sermon was about suffering. And that's Thanks. why I entered that first sermon because I know something mm -hmm. about being hurt. Mm -hmm. I know some, and still loving God. 
Yeah. Where yeah. was God when in my lifetime? when I needed God, but I'm here preaching because there is some good news. I thank yeah. God for the spirituals. Yes. If it hadn't been for the spirituals, I wouldn't have made it. And so I, I just, so, so, you know, that's where I am. You ask where I am and I, I'm ending this first year. I'm evaluating. I will say this seminary Southwest hired the right black woman to go mm -hmm. ahead and work through beloved, I would, beloved I community. Agree. Beloved yes, community. Yes, I, you can interview me. I know something about it. Yes. So I, 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 I'm I'm doing doing my research. Y'all ready? I'm ready. For, but I, so I'm ending that. I'm very excited mm -hmm. about what God is going to do. Uh, I'm, I'm more than elated. I know that God did this to come in, still in a PhD program, in a tenure track position, a chair mm -hmm. position. The position is named after the founder of the institution. I know God is doing this. Yeah. So I'm, wait a minute. Wait. I don't think people understand the magnitude wow, of what you said. You that said entering a tenure track without a PhD, <laughs> working on a PhD. If I don't, I will mess up this camera. I will dance right here. They, they don't understand the magnitude of what you just said, baby. Yeah. You're working on a PhD and you're already on the tenure track. Correct. Listen. That is God and God alone, but do not discount your capabilities and your abilities because God has brought you through with your mind stayed on him. Come on, yeah. Mm -hmm. And Listen. that's the part. Now that was the part that was the challenge. It was my mind. It was my mind. Emotion. Work. I say it right now, your mind. So mm -hmm. I'm we're excited mm -hmm. and, and grateful for you. Um, mm -hmm. of course, you know you're coming back, but I want to want you to talk a little more, more about your dissertation, just a little bit more about it, because we understand the, the disabilities and if they're in the in the pulpit or have we ever seen it? And you're teaching your young people about preaching. OK, it's all right to touch your neighbor, but I need you to t touch your text as our um, Dr. Kimberly Credit talk, um, the yes. late Dr. Kimberly Credit. Yes. But I want I want you to talk a little bit more about it, because, man, we've we've not seen a lot of it. Yet, yeah. <laughs> praise the Lord. So every fall I teach intro to preaching. Every spring I am. It, these are like fixed classes that are within my, you know, wheelhouse. As they would say, I am teaching basically a Christian education course on mm -hmm. children and young adult formation. I'm praying about adding, you know, some adult Christian formation to that somewhere in my journey. But y'all know the goal is to get this degree done. So do what's necessary first. Um, so in my intro to preaching course, you know, first off, I give a lot of homage and respect to those who taught me preaching. Uh, the Reverend. Dr. Teresa Fry Brown, I pulled a lot of my pedagogical approaches uh, from the way I engaged preaching in her class. Um, I've taken preaching classes from Dr. Uh, Frank Thomas, Dr. Courtney Buggs, um, focusing particularly around Hebrew scriptures with Dr. Valerie Ridgman, focusing mm -hmm. on Testament scriptures with Dr. Shively Smith. So the truth is I've been shaped by Black women, um, the majority of Black women. And so much of what I do was already done and I've just nuanced it for my style. Uh, I am very much um, a, uh, I would call it an impromptu preaching professor. Uh, if we are talking about something and you have done the reading, then you should be able to do a three minute sermon in class right now. Uh, <laughs> which is pushing against the grain. It pushes against the grain of where I teach. I teach at an Episcopalian seminary. They are lectionary preachers. I, I'm not saying that anything is wrong with lectionary preachers. What I'm saying is there are assigned texts that they are prepared to study to preach each week. And I push them to have heart texts. And I push them to say, based off of this context, what would you say to these people? What is God saying to you? Reminding them that they have to be ever ready in some ways. And so when I'm teaching preaching, I declare that preaching versus inspirational speech is centered around a sacred text. Therefore, you must teach and preach the text. You must do your exegetical work. Don't get up sounding like you're reading a commentary. Do your work to know the context of the text, but ask yourself the question, what does God need to say to these people about this text or how is this text speaking? Do you have fear when you preach God's word? Uh, I appreciate that question. You yeah. know, my answer is yes. Every time I have to preach and Dr. Bradford could be a witness to this. My stomach hurts so bad. I'd be so nervous. I'd be wondering if I even should be doing this. So my fear is, is a, it every time. It's, it's a reverence and respect 
for the task or the calling or the gifting of preaching. Um, I think it's an audacious uh, assignment to say you're speaking on behalf of God to God's people. And so it's one that I do not take lightly. My grandmother, who didn't have more than a third grade education, would tell me that if you are nervous, you are in the right position to do God's work, because then that means you're not relying on yourself. So uh, I hope I'm saying your name right. A shelter 0921. I hear when you say, uh, or do you have fear when you preach God's word? The answer is yes. But I need you to know it is a fear that does not debilitate me, but a fear that makes me reverence the preparation for execution and try to do it as care filled as possible. I recognize that nobody does things perfect, but we definitely have to be mindful of making sure people don't feel excluded from the experience. And so I'm fearful of it, but I rely on God to do it. My, when I tell you, yes, I've Ooh. experienced that many times um, with you, but when you step to that pulpit, God is all over you. And I am so grateful that I get to experience it a lot. Um, I love, we love you, Dr. Robinson. Of course, you're coming back for real. Um, <laughs> <we can> have, <laughs> um, thank you again. Please stay backstage so that we can um, chat a bit. But I want to share with you next week, we have a triple threat. My goodness, we have... <laughs> Dr. Freeman, I'm going to go ahead and say it, Dr. Freeman, Dr. Shazetta, and Dr. Amber. Yes, I'm speaking it into existence. Come on in the room. Next week, you will not be disappointed as you never are. God will see it through, and we are, we will too. We yeah, love we'll you. See some young folk formation. That's it. That's it. There is, we love you, and there's nothing there's that you'll ever do to do about it. See you next week, same time and same place. Bye. Right. Well, okay. Well, they want us to keep the broadcast going. They want us to stop. All right. It looks good to me.